Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Parkland's 25th Annual Conference, Building the Future We Need, Hope, Transformation, and Action. Uh, my name is Shima Robinson. I'm the Programming Coordinator at APERG, which is the Alberta Public Interest Research Group, and a member of the Parkland Institute's Programming Committee. We are so happy that so many of you can join us for this exciting intergenerational conversation with Maud Barlow, Sadie Bipond, and Harun Ali. Before we introduce our guest speakers, I want to first recognize that I'm speaking to you from Edmonton, Treaty 6 territories, but we have people joining us from across Alberta on Treaty 7 and 8 lands. We acknowledge that what we call Alberta is the traditional ancestral territory of many peoples, namely the Blackfoot Confederacy, Kainai, Pekani, and Siksika, the Cree, Dene, Soto, Nakota Sioux, Stony Nakota, and the Satina Nation and Métis people of Alberta. We acknowledge the many First Nations, Métis and Inuit who have lived in and cared for these lands for generations. We make this acknowledgement as an act of reconciliation and gratitude to those whose territory we reside on or are visiting. We also want to thank all of our sponsors who have made it possible for us to host the conference this year. Those sponsors include the Faculty of Arts at the University of Alberta, Alberta Federation of Labor, Alberta Teachers Association, AUPE, CUPE Alberta, Health, the Health Sciences Association of Alberta, or HSAA, the United Nurses of Alberta, Civic Services Union Local 52, the Non-Academic Staff Association at the University of Alberta, AKA NASA, Woodsworth Urban Socialist Fellowship, APERG and LPERG, LPERG being Lethbridge uh, Public Interest Research Group, have provided free registrations to students. And our media sponsors are CJSR Radio and the wonderful Alberta Views magazine. Thank you so much, Shima. As Shima said, my name is Jen Prosser and I'm the director of the University of Lethbridge Public Interest Research Group, LPERG. I am coming to you from Blackfoot Land, Treaty 7 and Métis Region 3 territory. We are happy to have one of our student board members work with Parkland on the programming committee. I'm very excited to introduce our speakers today. Maud Barlow is a Canadian activist and author. She chairs the board of the Washington-based Food and Water Watch and Ottawa-based Blue Planet Project. Maud co-founded the Council of Canadians and chaired its board for over three decades. She serves on the Board of Advisors of the Global Alliance for the Rights of Nature and is a counselor with the Hamburg-based World Future Council. Maud is the, ch is, a, is the Chancellor of Brassica University College in London, Ontario. Maud is the recipient of 14 honorary doctorates as well as many awards, including the 2005 Wright Livelihood Award, known as the Alternative Nobel, and the 2005 Lannan Foundation Cultural Freedom Fellowship Award, the Citation of Lifetime Achievement at the 2008 Canadian Environment Awards, the 2009 Earth Day Canada Outstanding Environmental Achievement Award, the 2009 Planet in Focus Eco Hero Award, and the 2011 Earth Care Award, the highest international honour of the Sierra Club. In 2008-2009, she served as Senior Advisor on Water to the 63rd President of the United Nations General Assembly and was a leader in the campaign to have water recognized as a human right by the UN. She is the creator of the Blue Communities Project in which municipalities pledge to protect water as a human right and a public trust and ban plastic bottled water. There are no now more than 25 million people living in official blue community towns and cities, including Paris, Berlin, Brussels, Los Angeles, Vancouver, and Montreal. Maud is also the author of dozens of reports, as well as 20 books, including her latest, Boiling Point, Government Neglect, Corporate Abuse, and Canada's Water Crisis, and Whose Water Is It Anyway? Taking Water Protection into Public Hands. Her upcoming book, Still Hopeful, Lessons from a Lifetime of Activism, will be published in 2022. Our next speaker, Harun Ali. Harun Ali is an activist, environmentalist, and community organizer. In 2021, he ran for the Edmonton City Council unsuccessfully, but managed to build a campaign from the ground up at the age of 18. His current work focuses on issues like policing, public transit, housing, as well as the environment and climate change. And Sadie Vibond. 
Sadie Vipond is a 15-year-old grade 10 student who lives in Calgary, Alberta. She attended COP26 in Glasgow, Scotland, where she was interviewed by national media on youth climate activism. Back home in Canada, she was also interviewed by The Sprawl. Sadie is one of 15 litigants suing the federal Canadian government for a safe climate future for her and all youth. She has passion for the outdoors and feels happiest when she's skiing in the mountains, hiking Alberta's badlands in search of dinosaur fossils and everything in between. Sadie is working towards a safe climate future for all creatures, which hinges, hinges on preventing the worst effects of the climate emergency. Uh, I will turn it over to Maud. I'm uh, coming to you from the unceded uh, territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe. In, I live in the city of Ottawa. Um, and I'm just delighted to have this opportunity. I think it was a brilliant idea of Bill Kilgannon's um, to have this intergenerational discussion. And I think it came from a discussion that Bill and I were having about the whole concept of hope. Um, I've been very worried for a long time around the amount of information which could be a good thing, but can be a, 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 de a, a depressing and, and difficult thing too for us all to hear when, when it's coming all the time. But I think particularly when you're young and you're hearing things like there's only you know 10 years left of a good planet or the oceans are dying or the sixth great extinction and so on. And I've been worried about that. I feel that it's incredibly important that we, we keep hope um, intergenerationally and, and in every other way. Um, and the, the idea of my book called Still Hopeful um, Lessons from a Lifetime of Activism came when I was on a panel in a beautiful June evening in 2019 on the New Green Deal in Ottawa in a big old church and it was packed. We had to turn people away and particularly there were a lot of young people there and uh, including my 16, then 16 year old granddaughter and um, that we were all kind of really negative at that point because the federal government had just bought a pipeline. I mean, we just couldn't believe it. And the BC government, which is NDP, um, had said they're not going to stop the Site C dam and they were going to continue with fracking. And, you know, we were a lot of us, I think, feeling a lot of anxiety. Um, and, and that came across, I think, in the panel. And so when I spoke, I spoke about hope and I talked about things that we people are doing that is hopeful. And we got into a debate then about how much realism, how much hope kind of thing. And I, I tell you that because at the end, two high school women in grade uh, 12 came up to me both in tears and said, thank you for talking about hope because we're just starting out on our lives in this part of our lives and we, we needed that. So I really, um, so, that, so that's when I decided, I walked home that night. It was a beautiful full moon, I remember. And I thought, I'm gonna write a book and talk about the things I've learned. So I'm just gonna speak for a few minutes and then we're gonna have a discussion um, with the three of us and maybe even the five of us with our wonderful moderators. But things uh, you know, are even since that night ha have become in some ways um, more frightening. We had, have had and still have COVID. Um, many of us watched uh, very closely the COP26 process and many, many concerns coming out of there. Um, we have over the uh, lifetime of this COVID seen the rise of, of overt racist um, incidents, um, assaults and so on in our country. And we're all now watching what's happening in British Columbia with the fires in this in the summer and now the well we all know what's happening now and we know the the cause the human cause of, of what's happening here and the, our hearts you know our hearts uh, are, are just pounding for um, for relief and and for justice for the people there so. And yet I'm hopeful. And I, so I wanna talk about what that kind of hope means. And I spent a lot of time in the book on this concept of false hope versus um, uh, real hope or what uh, Joan Halifax, who's a Zen Buddhist teacher in, in the United States, she works with uh, men on death row. I mean, you can't get more, you know, in a more maybe unhopeful situation, but she writes on hope and she says, she calls it wise hope and talks about the need for us to see the difference between what might be optimism, which is everything's fine and I don't need to do anything, and pessimism, which is everything's awful and there's nothing to be done. And what's the place in between there? Well, she calls it wise hope. And wise hope 
requires engagement. Neither happy optimism or terrible pessimism requires you to do anything. And I often I'll, I'll meet, you know, graduate students or whatever, and they're highly, highly educated and they've got the world by the tail. And I say, why don't you, aren't you doing something about what, you know, what these issues that you, you talk about, but you're not doing anything about, well, because there's nothing to be done. So we need this kind of wise hope. Um, and Wise Hope says that what we do matters, even if we can't control the outcome. It's very important for us to understand that we need goals, we need timetables, we need plans, we want to bring people in, and I'm a very big on never giving a problem and not a solution, but you do need to, to um, you know, have those goals, but you also have to know that you won't always get what you want, uh, when you want it, or how you think you want it, um, and you can't control the outcome. Vanana Shiva, um, the wonderful scientist food sovereignist, says that she becomes deeply engaged in any in, in the issues that she's working on, the campaign, the, the, the issue that she's on, you know, the food issue or whatever. But she remains detached from the outcome because if she thinks that she can carry it all on her shoulders, she's wrong. Then I remember having a wonderful conversation with a a 99 year old friend of mine just a week before she died uh, and she she and her husband who was an educator fought uh, they lived in Guelph and they kept um, they kept Walmart out of Guelph for years they were just adamant and in fact he Griff Morgan his name was uh, was on a panel one night uh, and gave a fiery speech against Walmart and then dropped dead in front of everybody young and old Die with his boots on, and the next day in the in the uh, Mer the Guelph Mercury, they had a picture of Vi and and Griff and me, and the mayor saying, "Now, uh, have heaven safe from Walmart," which was quite sweet. But when, anyway, when I met with Vi, she said, "Do you have a quiet mind?" And I said, "I'm looking for one because that's the hard one for me. I'm always wanting success, you know, success on these campaigns. And why aren't people coming in and 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 being, you know?" Um, not being very patient. And she said, you will have a quiet mind when you truly understand that there's a greater force out there, that humanity is doing things, people are doing things that you don't know about and can't do it all, and can't know about. And although you face reality, what you have to overcome is this notion that you can control the future in that way. You don't know um, how it's going to happen. So we have to be committed to the struggle, but we have to be, as I say, um, uh, uh, a little divorced from, from uh, getting things the way we think we want it. Rebecca Solnit is a wonderful um, writer, thinker, uh, activist from the United States. She wrote a, a wonderful book called Hope in the Dark. And she said, look, progress isn't an army moving, marching forward. It's a crab scuttling sideways. It's, it's water um, moving down a stone over the millennia, it, things change in ways you can't imagine. And, and that, it, it's very important for us. And I have a whole chapter on the changes for women in my lifetime. Um, my mother was born just years after the Elections Act change. And it used to say, no women, idiot, lunatics, or criminals shall uh, vote, right? I mean, a lot changed in those hundred years. A lot changed in a very short period of time. Much still means to, remains to be done, but we can make fundamental changes. And the most important thing around um, activism is building a movement. Uh, we think, you know, you'll want to get this done and you want to bring people in and then move on. Building a movement is as important or more important than, uh, than any goal that we can take. Uh, and it means bringing new people in. It means bringing young people in. It means uh, taking diversity and inclusion very seriously. It means taking the time to um, understand one another's values and knowing that you won't always get that right. It won't always be resolved, but that the, 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 the will for it to be resolved is there. Um, and we have to take care of one another and one and of ourselves. One thing I've noticed, I've remarked on, and many of us have lived through in our move, in our movement, and I expect it exists everywhere, our divisions and sometimes hurt. Um, and I think it's very important for us to use the word kindness, to be gentle, to remember what other people are doing, to thank them, to make sure you give credit to others, that you, as much as possible, take your ego out of things and, um, and be kind. I think kindness is, is in short supply in our society, in our culture here in North America. And I think it's that competitive thing and that individual, you know, even on the left or even in progressive movements, you'll see that. And it's very, very important that we find ways to um, take care of each other.
So that's just some opening thoughts on hope. And I just want to give you some signs that I think are hopeful. Because again, I know that we're all, we're all, if you're on listservs, you're getting every day, I get, particularly on the water issue, I get information, more information on, you know, a drought here, a crisis there, and it's, it's not easy, but there are signs of hope. And I guess the first that I want to say is that I do not believe we have ever, as a human species, been as ready to deal with the climate crisis as we are now. Are we dealing with it properly? Obviously not. But are we, do we know what needs to be done? And I would say we're closest that we've ever been. Because of the information exchange, because of our ability to speak to each other, the, because of our, in, our, the inability of some to hide stuff, they still try to hide it, it's out there. And I think it's really important for us to know that we are on the verge of being able to make profound change. And when you get people in leadership positions at COP saying the same thing that some of the youth and indigenous and um, you know environmental climate uh, leaders are saying at the COP, then you say, okay, but they don't mean it, but they know they have to say it. We are at a place now where we're beginning to understand the collective issues. That's one. A second is the issue of water. I've helped build a, a, an international water justice movement we decided it was really important that we wanted to get the United Nations to recognize the human right to water and sanitation, because up until then, that did happen on July 28, 2010, up until then, uh, the World Bank and the countries like Canada, which were opposed to it, and, and the big water companies called it a, a need. The lack of water and sanitation is a need that can be filled by charity. And we said, no, this is an issue of justice, not charity. And it's extraordinarily important that we change the language here. And that happened. And since then, uh, four, almost four dozen countries have either amended their constitutions to recognize the human right to water or brought in new legislation. One example is Mexico changed its constitution to recognize the human right to water. A few years later, another government tried to bring in uh, public-private partnerships, privatization of water services. And our movement there said, no way, that's a contradiction of what you've agreed to. And the government backed off. We've been fighting water privatizations of municipalities for years now, and we're winning that fight. There are now something like 337 uh, major towns, but mostly major cities around the world that tried privatization, realized it was a mistake and have gone back. And that's been uh, something we've done through, partly through this Blue Communities project that um, Jen, uh, when she introduced, um, introduced uh, me, talked about a little bit, which is where we get municipalities to promise to protect water as a human right and as a public trust and to do away with, with uh, bottled water. Um, so this has been really, uh, I just think that's been exciting. I also wanna say another hopeful sign is the whole concept of biodiversity restoration, which we're hearing a lot about, like and I'm doing research for the book, there's just a tsunami of understanding that yes, while we need to continue to work to uh, limit and, and, and eventually stop the, the carbon footprint, the, the uh, greenhouse gas emissions, we carbon, uh, the um, soil, uh, uh, forests, watershed, uh, wetlands, these all need protection and restoration. And not only are they not all just victims of climate change, they're all causes of climate change. And restoring watersheds, restoring, uh, protecting and restoring forests is an incredibly important piece of the climate puzzle. I do want to put a quick um, warning in here, though. You're going to hear a lot more about something called nature-based solutions. Some of you already know about this. The concept is great. It's that, that you think about these other you know, soil and forests and so on as being carbon sinks, and that will help as we reduce uh, the carbon footprint. But it, it, it's in danger of being hijacked by corporate and commercial and financial interests who are talking now about bringing nature into the market and let it, having nature compete against other uh, profit-making entities to justify itself. And they're talking about biodiversity and forest assets and carbon assets and so on. I don't want to get off because I'm being hopeful, but I just want to put that uh, concern out. Uh, there's another hopeful sign, and that is that the UN has just adopted a new resolution recognizing the human right to a healthy environment. This is something that David Boyd, who is a wonderful person, uh, happens to be Canadian and happens to be the, not happens to be, he's earned this, the UN Special Rapporteur on, on um, 
uh, and, uh, environment and human rights. He's been writing books and speaking about this all over the world because he says, if you want environmental protection, you have to understand the need for human rights. You can't separate them. And if you get legislation within a country recognizing the human rights aspect of an environmental issue, environmental racism and so on, you're strengthened. And this is a really big, uh, exciting change. We've also been doing a number of us work on the whole concept of the rights of nature. And the rights of nature basically takes all of this uh, quite a bit further. And it's, it's very new and it's very ancient. It's the rights of mother earth. This is all the indigenous teachings, of course, which is that we are nature, we are water, we are forests. Now you're not protecting nature, you're protecting yourself as well because we're all nature. Um, but this has got a new iteration in, in that people are beginning to ask how we can turn the laws, particularly in the, in the Western industrial world, to not just limit how much pollution takes place, but actually recognize the human right, or the not human right, the right legal right of rivers to flow, of, of, of fish to continue to exist. And of course, you're not saying nobody can fish, but what you're saying is that you don't fish a river to extinction. And there are two examples in Canada that are very exciting. Uh, in Northern Quebec, the First Nation there has been granted the right to grant its river, Mag the Magpie River, legal status. And they are responsible for taking care of that river and, and protecting it um, for future generations. And they've got a very clear mandate. But they're working with a number of other First Nations and um, uh, environmental groups and communities to begin to think about naming the St. Lawrence River um, as, as having legal rights. And that would be absolutely incredible. The concept is really changing our relationship to, to nature, to water, to the forests, and saying that we have to um, see that these, they're not resources for our personal uh, um, profit and, and convenience. Um, that we have to change the way we relate to them. I mean, we take water from where nature clearly has put it, where the creator has put it, and we take it where we want it, and then we wonder um, what happened. And by the way, I don't know, some of you may know, but that uh, prairie that has been flooded in, in the Fraser Valley used to be a lake. And of course, with our hubris, our human hubris, in 1921, I think they drained it. And of course, as Toni Morrison, the great poet said, um, water is, has a perfect memory and always wants, is always seeking to go back where it was. And of course that water has, has re-entered um, that, that valley. Um, I wanna say two last things in, 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 in the hopeful area. And then I'm gonna open this up for the discussion with, with my friends and colleagues here. The, the second last thing that's hopeful for me, and I know it, 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 it may not feel like it, especially with the, the RCMP raiding the camp um, in British Columbia last night and how concerned we all are with that and many other issues. I still want to say that in all my years of activism, I have never felt a time when Canadians, non-Indigenous Canadian settlers were as, as, as determined um, to, 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 to seek reconciliation and wanting it in a true and deep way. Um, uh, is it being done properly? Obviously, uh, uh, um, uh, not always, you know, often not. Is the desire there? I believe it is. And in fact, I want to tell you about a good poll you may not know about because we are, as you know, we're getting reports of increased rate of racism, uh, uh, incidents of violence, racist based violence uh, online and, and physically in person in the last couple of years. But a very recent poll just from January, last this past January, um, found the pollster decided they wanted to know, well, what does this mean? Is there, is there more racism in Canada? And in fact, they found the opposite, that if people who were articulating this racism or acting it out, if they thought they were, going to make, they were going to impact Canadians to be more racist, they found the opposite. And that in all their years of polling, this pollster said, I've never seen a time when Canadians generally are so wanting reconciliation, are so are so welcoming of, of migrants and immigrants, um, recognizing that racism exists in Canada, um, and and wanting to change that, so that it's, it's having those awful incidents seem may make it seem worse, but in fact they're having the opposite effect. And that's nothing's perfect in Wise Hope, but it does say this is a direction for us that's hopeful. 
And then the last thing, obviously, is the incredible leadership that youth have taken in this climate fight. I mean, I don't need to tell the people on this uh, uh, here because I, I'm, I'm sure I'm speaking to many, many activists and, and many youth, but the, it, it's, we've always had youth activists, of course, but there's been something new here. And it's like the youth aren't waiting for somebody to give them permission. And when people say you don't know anything yet, you're only in grade 10 or you're only 20 years old and you haven't got a PhD or whatever, they're saying, uh-uh, you know, with all your knowledge and with all your power and with all your uh, fancy degrees, you haven't stopped this. And there is, a, a, I mean, I meet students who could be teaching their teachers in terms of these issues. And it, it gives me enormous hope. Um, and that's not to dump it on this generation and say, well, whew, sorry, kids, you know, this is to say that there are many of us who've been doing a lot um, for these years and will continue to, to do a lot. And this passes. This is part of the movement building that the generation passes it on to the next generation. But, you know, you don't walk away and say, it, you know, we did nothing we did nothing is not true. There is just a lot of wonderful work. There is a lot of healing going on. There's a lot of caring going on. Um, and for many people who don't know, who can't find that place, I'm not saying be tolerant of the haters. I'm not talking about that. But I, I think there are people who don't know how to come into this place of grace. Um, and that's going to be part of the, Thomas Homer Dixon writes about this, and I know you had him last year. Um, and Kate Raworth, who spoke this morning, I mean, she is a beacon of hope around an alternative to the growth imperative, to the e economic model that we have. Um, there are so many avenues to find, and there's so many avenues to step into. So I'm just going to leave the formal part of what I'm saying with, with the thought that a friend of mine who's a farmer who says that when he gets feeling overwhelmed, he asks himself, I can't do it. He says to himself, I can't do everything. I'm not responsible for everything. But I can ask myself, what's the next appropriate step to take? And I take it. And that helps because if you think I have to do the whole thing, mm, that can be really paralyzing. If you say, to, I can do this, and then I can do this, and I can do this, and I can bring others, and I can have some faith that there's a greater there's a creator and that creator is the is the good thing in the human spirit we um, will get through this um, together better and as Banksy the wonderful uh, street artist from Great Britain says if you get tired learn to rest not to quit so those are my opening thoughts so I'm going to ask each of them a question now well Sadie I'm going to start with you you were at COP26 as one of the youth delegates um, and spoke to all of us from there. And you saw up close and personal what happened in COP. So I'd love for you to share with us your thoughts on, on the, 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 um, the gathering, your thoughts on where we are on climate and your thoughts on the issue of hope and the climate crisis. When I was at COP, it was a life-changing experience. I feel that there was so much hope in regards to when I was participating in the Fridays for Future protest and the other march on the Saturday, the People's uh, Summit march, I believe. Um, it was so, so powerful and shocking about how many people attended and I, after the Fridays for Future strike, I saw on Twitter a video of one long giant straight uh, street and there was people from beginning to end and in the distance both ways and it was absolutely packed. It was so, so amazing. The energy that was there and just the power of it there was also people that spoke um, afterwards, like Greta Thunberg, some indigenous people from Brazil, which, 
what they had to share and how far they had traveled to um, come to Glasgow was, it was so powerful. I had a lot of hope with the public um, and how energetic everybody was. Um, less so with the governments in the negotiations and in the blue zone. Um, but it was definitely a step forward. I do believe that we do need to take more radical action and hold our governments accountable. But for me, the public and the people brought together was just really moving for me. Thank you so much for that, um, Sadie. I'm just going to ask you a quick follow-up question and then go to Harun. When you got home, what was it like going back to school? I mean, I know you come from a politically aware family, so there was probably, you know, everyone loved what you were there for and, and, and supported it. How did you feel going back? Because I know I've come home from events like this and I want to tell the whole world and People are just going on with their lives. And what kind of reaction and reception did you get um, with your friends and classmates and your school? Um, it was very positive. I was insanely jet lagged on the, on the first day of school when I came back. So it, it's kind of all a blur, but yeah, my teachers and my friends were so supportive and so interested that I had gone to Glasgow and seen so many interesting people. Um, they were shocked to learn that the musician Rafi follows me on Twitter because he is such uh, an amazing climate activist. Um, it was super positive and it really filled me up, it made me really happy. Would you say half the people in your classes are aware of these issues and maybe half not, a third and two thirds? How would you describe that? I think everybody is aware, but maybe not feeling it as deeply as I am to take action. But I, there's definitely um, uh, some of my classmates do take action and it is cool to share that with them on some radio stuff that I did and that I sounded awesome and I spoke really powerful and I hope I like educated some people back in Calgary when I was in Glasgow. And as you know Greta Thunberg speaks about and writes about the fact that she when she first really understood the climate crisis she went into a deep depression for almost two years and she lost something like 20 pounds and she's not a big person, that's a lot of weight, right? And it was when she took action and she still knew all the bad stuff, she still, you know, but it's when she took action that that changed and she, her depression lifted and she channeled it into activism, which um, clearly you're doing and, and you'll be, you are a role model for others your age to do. Haroon, uh, you um, amazingly ran for city council in Edmonton. That takes a great deal of courage at your age. Uh, I wouldn't have had that kind of courage at your age to, to articulate a, a platform and a vision. Can you share with us that experience? And I know you also have written about and others who were also running for that and other positions um, during that election um, have also experienced racism. Can you talk to us about um, why you did it? What makes you hopeful? And why you, because I see that you would be prepared to put your name forward again. And I see you as a future leader, so. I kind of first started the campaign back in August of 2020. That's when I went on Twitter and said, I am running in Ward 9, which no longer exists. And January, I formally decided that I was gonna run Papasteo. And um, yeah, it's been a journey. I was a university student then. I was full-time, so I was taking classes and still 
attending speaking engagements. I was still out there door knocking. I was still out there actually flyer dropping, talking with folks in the community. It's been one of the most interesting points in my life. Even every single time I knock on the door, people, you know what I mean? We talk, there was a column that always likes to build connection with things. I always like to find one common point for us that we can build off and we can have a conversation on. So throughout the campaign, we talked about four major themes, policing, housing, trends, and climate change. And we talked about it with folks in the community and we had a really good positive outcome. We were able to raise a profile on what's called on police accountability. I was actually the only candidate in the city that had a policing plan. We were able to actually take action on public housing. And that's exactly what we're doing right now, actually our team. We transitioned into a somewhat of a think tank now. And now we're gonna be pushing Edmonton City Council on housing, public, uh, what's called public transit, policing and environment and climate change to make sure that we're actually taking steps towards it because municipalities play such a big, big, big role in how our government works and how our government systems actually act. And it's incredibly important for us to make sure that our municipal politicians are actually working in our favor and that we're actually taking steps towards actively ensuring that we're reducing emissions, that we're taking big steps towards building more public housing, and that we're taking big steps to make sure that we're actually allowing for more police accountability and that we're actually allowing for stronger communities across Edmonton and across everywhere. Uh, for me, when it comes to racism, uh, that was that was a big theme throughout the campaign. Unfortunately, for us, we actually even had to uh, like we we, we did geo mapping. We, we looked into areas where we thought we could do the best, and that was very cool. The Old Strathcona area, where I think we won two polls in Old Strathcona area, but nevertheless, so uh, what's called uh, the further down you went, I we we did end up experiencing some more problems with me being a black man talking about police reform. Uh, I remember I remember vividly the one conversation I had where. I was out door knocking in uh, Empire Park and I was talking to somebody about what's called actually investing in people and reducing the EPS budget. The first thing he said to me, and he looked me dead shit in the eyes and said, I ought to bash your head in for thinking of an idea like that. You know what I mean? And for me and my team, and for me, I just said, okay, well, have a good day. And I know for me, what's called well, for me, I've kind of become numb at this point, unfortunately. <laughs> it's, it's just become a reality because I've door knocked in so many different constituencies. I door knocked for Amber Jade Soe in Edmonton Millwoods. I door knocked for Christina Gray in Edmonton Millwoods. I also door knocked for Tom Stang in Edmonton South. So I've had this experience before. And unfortunately, the only thing you can really do is walk away because, you know, at the same time, you want to confront systemic racism, which I think everyone should. But at the same time, though, you can't put your safety in jeopardy. You know what I mean? So there's only a limit of things that we could have done. Even for me, I remember sometimes knocking doors and Duggan. I remember this one really, really bad shift that we had where we were out door knocking and we had a couple We had a couple teenage girls with, uh, with me. We were talking with folks. Most folks seemed receptive. But within two hours, we had about five different people call me the N-word. And people... and people didn't feel safe. And unfortunately we had to, we had to end that canvassing shift and they, and those two girls actually never came back because once, and I don't blame them because it is incredibly ridiculous that we're living in 2021 and we still have people thinking in that mindset. Same thing with climate denial, you know what I mean? Where we think that where people still think that um, individual actions don't matter. Individual actions matter a lot. Individual actions need to be followed up with larger larger scales action from government organizations. But in the meantime, though, that doesn't mean that you can, it means that everyone needs to do something. You know what I mean? Everyone needs to chip in their parts. And I think the majority of people want to do their part. It's just that some of them don't know where to get started. And that's why I'm so happy nowadays I don't know. I don't know what they're teaching nowadays, but <laughs> I remember two years ago for me, I, we, we had vivid conversations about climate change. We had vivid conversations about housing and social studies. And, and these things prepare students for future things. You know what I mean? And that's why we're seeing so many more student activism. You know what I mean? I remember back in, I believe it was 2018 when they had when we had that climate strike where students were actually walking out of classrooms and multiple of us I, I know for us at Lillian Osborne you know what I mean lots of us walked out and people people understood what was happening so I think I think nowadays youth are getting more and more and more aware of what's happening around the surroundings and we're slowly taking steps towards building a better Edmonton a better Alberta and a better country you are fabulous. Um, you and Sadie, you're just fabulous. Just uh, you, you give such hope back. And that's what the, this is all about. Um, I really want to, to, to promote this notion that you were talking about, about local action and municipal action. I think a lot of us are saying, yes, we need 
international and national and provincial legislation, but the action is going to, to come closer to home. And it's, it's, you know, this commitment to building something in a local community, as they say, all politics is local, I think is wonderful. Do you, so you, you're, you intend to stay a room with, with, a room with this, with your projects and the work that you're doing. You're not, you didn't get feeling it was not worth it and therefore I won't try again. Oh, absolutely not. We actually, fun fact, our campaign, we actually broke multiple records. I'm actually the youngest person in Alberta to ever register to run for an election. And I'm actually possibly one of the youngest people to ever register in Canada. I we also actually broke the record for most donations. We beat Ash Salvador by two people. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll be keeping that trophy. And uh, hey, you know, I mean, 1,700 people voted for an 18-year-old. 1,700 people voted for a future that they believed in. And that is phenomenal. You know what I mean? For a first-time run, I think, I think, hey, I think that's phenomenal. We had lots of good conversations with people. And even though some people didn't vote with me, even on the doorsteps, people are telling me that they liked the ideas, they liked the campaign. And it was fun. You know what I mean? Like we had a great, our, our team, you know what I mean? Like for me, something I was really keen on focusing on was making sure that our team had an opportunity to learn. Our team had an opportunity to engage and our team had an opportunity to actually get something out of it. You know what I mean? We were a majority of BIPOC students. You know what I mean? We were young. I think the youngest we had on our team was actually 15. And lots of students had an opportunity to get on board with our campaign. And learn something. And I think at the end of the day, I think we all have learned something. I still stay in contact with lots of folks. And I think at the end of the day, I think it was a phenomenal campaign. And I'm excited for what's next. Thank you so much for this. And, and you know, when you talk, Harun, about your team, I, it's very clear to me you care about them. And I expect you took good care of them. And, and hopefully they took good care of you. I am Absolutely. deeply sorry about the racism that you met at the door. It's mind boggling that in our day and age, we, we don't want to think it happens and exists here, but of course it does. And that's what the poll I was referring to says that people are, are much more aware of, of, of the fact that there is racism in Canada and, and how wrong it is, which doesn't make, it doesn't make it mean it's eradicated, but it means that for a lot of people, they're moving in the right, not the wrong direction. But I'm deeply sorry about that experience for you and I think it's one of the things that we can do generation to generation and support one another. Uh, Sadie or Haroon do you have any questions for me? What would you tell your 15 year old self in regards to activism? That is a great question. What would I tell my 15 year old self about activism? I have to tell you that I had a, a father who's dead now um, who was very committed to social um, justice. He was a, what was called, a, then he was a social worker, but he, he helped to develop criminology, the whole concept of criminology, that criminal people incarcerated have rights. And he was passionate about that and helped to um, rewrite the then uh, a, a Juvenile Delinquent Act, it was called, and um, all sorts of things. But the thing he was, did that I was most proud of was that he led the fight against capital and corporal punishment. So we had the last hanging in Canada in the Don Jail in 1960. My father was there with a placard opposing it. He wrote a book called Should Canada Abolish the Gallows and the Lash? Um, and that was the last. There were no more hangings in, in, in Canada, and I'm very proud of that. Um, the motto was, why kill people who kill people to show killing people is wrong. Um, and so I kind of got that fed to me with my oatmeal in the morning, you know, like justice is matters. And um, so, you know, maybe in that sense, I, I grew up thinking being an activist was a good thing. But what I would say to my 15 year old self is make the choice to become an activist. You're not going to make the most money in the world. Um, you know, you're not, it's not going to be a clear path. You're not going to join this and then you take this and then you get this, uh, you know, then you get uh, this seniority and it's not like that. I mean, I have been in most of the organizations I've been in, I've started or helped start. Um, it's Gandhi's, you know, if you don't know the path, you have to, you have to build it. You have to walk the path that you want to be on. And, and so it really does take sometimes a deep breath and courage. My gang at the Council of Canadians always laughed at me because I would say, we'll do this. And they'll say, we can't afford it. And I'll say, we'll do it and the money will come. Somehow somebody will find a way to help us do this. I used to call it the loaves of the fishes. I'm not religious. I'm maybe religious in nature or whatever, or spiritual in nature, but 
Um, I do remember the story from the Bible of, you know, it, it, the, don't worry about that stuff. It'll come it, to do the work. So I would say to my 15 year old self, um, jump and uh, take the chance and um, find good people out there to be supportive of you, which I have and um, be kind. Um, I funny the book when I wrote the book, I kept coming back to that theme of be kind because um, I think it's really missing in our movement sometimes and extraordinarily important for our souls. So thank you for that question. Would you ever consider running for politics? And a quick little follow-up question is, where do you think people can do the most work? And this is a question I've actually debated for a long time with a lot of folks, is that is it better for folks that want to change something to be inside the government, or is it better for folks to be outside banging on the door? You flatter me. I'm 74 and I'm not going to be running for office, but thank you very <laughs> much for that. That is lovely. The answer to your question is we need both. We need good people inside and we need people outside making sure they stay good, right? And I've had my battles over the years a bit with the NDP when, when people would say, well, you know, you, you need to be, come out, be, you know, when the Council of Canadians, for instance, for years, we were the largest social justice movement, uh, social environmental justice movement in Canada. And uh, why don't you just, you know, endorse the NDP? We had a, a, a very strict policy of not uh, endorsing any candidate or, or party. We would put out at every election, this is where all the parties stand on all the issues, and it'd be very clear which party was the best, but we, you know, we were not, we were, we felt that we had a, it, it, we, sh we shouldn't look like an arm of any political party because then we'd lose our, our power. We were also non part um, didn't have charitable status as we really did not want to, to be limited in what we could do to criticize the government. So I would say both, um, but you need to say to your political friends, these are different roles and don't expect us to serve you, you know, all by yourself or to say whatever you do is okay when it isn't. I mean, the example is watching the Horgan government in BC now. I have every sympathy with governments right now. There is no easy way to turn this ship of state. Canada built on oil and gas, we built on mining. Do you know that back in the late 1970s, uh, manufacturing uh, uh, accounted for, um, I'm gonna get this right now, 26% of our GDP. Do you know what it is now? It's, it's 11, we've, we, we've gone back from taking the things that we have been given, the forests and the fish and the, and the minerals and so on. And instead of doing something with us, then with them ourselves, we just sell them to the world, just raw material. So we have gone backwards in that. But I think we need both and we need society movements to push governments to keep them honest. For you, Haroon, I think you're gonna go into politics. I see politics in your future. And I think it's something that we can actually see change, but at the same time, I'm very cautious about what's called about activists getting involved in politics and then changing their views and then letting the system morph them in a little bit. It becomes redundant in a little bit. Well, we're all gonna watch the Minister Gilbo, who, uh, uh, who was an activist who worked with us on stopping the Energy East campaign. Uh, that was a terrible pipeline that was going to go from Hardesty, Alberta, all the way to a New Brunswick port, and we stopped it, and he played a huge role in that. So now he's a minister of the governor, government that bought a pipeline and that is supporting this Line 5, which is a pipeline we want closed, which goes under the Strait of Mackinac in, um, in the Great Lakes. Uh, so we'll see. It's, it's a hard, it's, you know, I'm glad he's there. Uh, he's going to be under enormous pressure from the movement to do things right to do what to be where they want him to be but at the same time he is a minister in the in the government and he'll have he'll have limits placed around what he can do. Thank you so much Maud, Sadie and Harun for this amazing conversation I've been snapping along the entire time I'm very it's it's so amazing so invigorating so we have about 20 minutes uh, to take questions from the audience our first question is from Nancy and Maud I believe this question is to you uh, the question is how can Edmonton become a blue water zone and does that mean all bottled waters will be gone from the store shelves okay well thanks for the question that the project is called blue communities and it's really targeted towards the municipal municipality itself 
So it would be the city of Edmonton. It would be Councillor Haroon when he's councillor or mayor um, that you would go to. And it would be the municipality that would take this position and it wouldn't take bottled water off the shelves. They would just say as one of the pledges that they would no longer provide bottled water on municipal premises and they wouldn't uh, have bottled water um, at concerts and, and conferences that the city puts on. Um, but it also has spread to universities and faith-based groups. And we are launching a project called Blue Schools where schools can also take this on to pledge to pr protect water as a human right, um, to, to understand the limits. I mean, don't get me started on water. You'll have to take a sheep hook and get me off, take this off. But I mean, when we for all first heard about COVID, the first thing we were told was wash your hands with, with soap and warm water. And lo and behold, UN said, yeah, well, at least half the population of the world doesn't have a place to do that, doesn't have a place to wash their hands with soap and warm water. And if there's a silver lining, by the way, in COVID, it is that a great deal of money has been given that used as COVID, you know, to, 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 towards um, COVID relief to building permanent sanitation in, in clinics. Imagine having a health clinic with no running water and then imagine that with a pandemic on top of it. It's exciting when we kind of think about moving ahead and what we can do um, with a concept of, of this, but we're, we're also understanding that not everywhere has clean water coming out of the tap. So the concept for Edmonton would be for Edmonton City Council to do this, but then we want us to start spreading it to the universities, to the schools, um, where we are blessed with clean water coming out of our taps, we should not be drinking bottled water, particularly out of plastic. And by the way, this last thing on water, every minute there are a million bottles of plastic water bought in the world. I mean, we are just piling them up. If you were to put them end to end, those little bottles, uh, the little plastic single use bottles end to end, they would reach halfway to the sun. And that's just one year's worth. And where does it go? It goes in our, you know, landfills, it goes in our lakes, it goes in our rivers, it goes in our oceans. And we have to find alternatives to that. And then we have to find, promise the goal of safe public tap water for everyone in the world. That's the unambitious goal that I have before I leave this mortal coil. The next question I have up is for Sadie. Uh, Laurie is asking, how do you get other youth to join you on any actions? Okay, so the first thing is always education. Um, people need to know about the climate crisis to fight the climate crisis. So if you're a youth or anyone really who wants to get involved, then educate yourself on the climate crisis and then find where um, I'm not sure if it's going now because of COVID. I'm pretty sure it's stopped in Calgary right now, but um, find the your local Fridays for Future group and join them in their strikes because that is such an amazing platform for people to get involved and to come together to fight this issue and yeah write letters to political leaders is also an important one and yeah one of my things is I try to say yes to every opportunity that I can that I think will change the world in a better way even if it's the tiniest 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 thing so yeah just take a chance at every opportunity that you get, if you think that it's worth it, like Maud said, you just go for a jump. Amazing. Uh, the next question is from Melanie, and this question is for Haroon. How can we support your work in Edmonton? Hi, Melanie. I actually know you ran for uh, MP in Edmonton Riverbend. And uh, yeah, for me right now, what I'm doing is I'm setting up an organization known as Edmonton's Future. There's a form to fill out online, and feel free to fill it out, and we'll add to the group. I have a question here from Leona, uh, directed to Maude, but also to all three uh, panelists, if y'all want to respond, about what advice do you have for the 37,000 plus Albertans on behalf of the entire Prairie region, defending the eastern slopes of the Rockies, aka the water tower, against coal mining, 
and a province based on resource extraction and with a government that doesn't believe in the finite resources of the earth regarding water. It's important to preserve our natural world and not just see it as um, an instantaneous flow of resources that will always be refilled once we take from it. And it's just, it's really important to have appreciation for nature and to be educated on the issues that are happening to uh, fight against them and to know what you value um, in regards to these issues. Thank you so much, Sadie. And thank you for the question. It is a terrible, outrageous thing that the Kenny government even considered giving water rights to uh, these coal companies to have them expand their coal uh, mining. It's just absolutely shocking. I know they've backed down to a certain extent, but they've got to back down completely. I mean, coal mining has got to stop here in Canada and everywhere. It's one of the worst forms of pollution, one of the worst forms of fossil fuels. We absolutely have to put our money where our mouth is. And when we're at COP and other places saying, you know, we're going to stop subsidizing fossil fuels and stop subsidizing coal in other countries that we're still doing it here. One of the issues, of course, is that there is this divide between the federal and provincial responsibility so that the federal government might take a position that it actually might mean um, on re deforestation or reforestation. And, and yet you can't stop. BC from taking down the old growth forest because it's a provincial jurisdiction or you can't stop Alberta from um, um, mining coal because it's considered uh, local. Um, and But we really need to insist on national standards on this. Water has got to come first with human, human rights and, and water together have to come first. Uh, we, we, you know, we have this myth of abundance in Canada. I call it the myth of abundance because we grew up thinking we have so much water, we can do anything we want. We can dump any amount of polluted crap into the groundwater. We can suck up the lake over here and bring it here because you know what, who cares? Do you know that when Harper was in power and this has not changed, he amended the Fisheries Act to say that a mining company can apply to the federal government to have a lake renamed a tailing impoundment area. Therefore, it's no longer a lake. Therefore, it's no longer protected by the Fisheries Act. That is outrageous. We now have dozens of mining impoundment areas across the country that used to be healthy watersheds, water, water systems. We've got to stop that. We don't have 20% of the world's water. That's if you, you'd have to drain every lake and river to get at that water, we have about 6.5% of the accessible water that you're not going to destroy the, the, the main resource uh, if, you're, if you're using it. We have, we, we have poor laws, we have poor water laws around mining, around extractive industries. We have poor laws around industrial agribusiness runoff from these factory farms. Um, causing blue-green algae. Lake Winnipeg is almost dead some years with such thick blue-green algae. There are 246 major lakes in Canada in a recent study that were found to be very seriously ill from this eutrophication, this runoff. We allow chemicals that should not be allowed. Um, there are some bright spots there. The government is renewing, uh, reviewing and renewing the Environmental Protection Act uh, and they are going to consider and, and name uh, um, uh, uh, the human right to an, a healthy environment. And they're looking, they've promised to take seriously the issue of chemical compounds and microplastics and so on, but we have to stay at them. They've set up a new Canada water agency and we must be demanding that this water agency protect the waters of, 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 uh, of, all, uh, the, of all of Canada. And we know that indigenous communities in particular, there's been just assault after assault on uh, territorial waters for, for fracking, for mining, um, for coal mining. So it's, it's a wonderful question. It's really, really important that every Albertan step in. Kenny is in trouble, let's face it. He's politically in trouble. This is a very good time to, to demand what we need. And, I think the NDP can win the next election and we need to get a pledge from the NDP clear, and it might exist. I'm not saying it does a clear, clear 
statement uh, about coal because it's it's totally the wrong direction. And even ranchers, even ranchers who vote for Kenny <laughs> are opposed to this, which amazes me that they could still be talking about it. So thank you for that question. As Maud said, Kenny's popularity is declining significantly. Keep on fighting. They caved on childcare. They caved on COVID restrictions. They will keep caving because at the end of the day, Albertans are the ones that control their government. So just keep on fighting. It may be long, it may be hard, but just keep on going at it. I'm going to ask a very large question. What do you recommend to contend with misinformation from the bad actors who work against making the world better? Um, there are several kinds of misinformation. There's misinformation for, from good people who are reading the wrong things or are afraid for other reasons. And let's face it, there are people who've come here newly or come from parts of our country that have not for the good reasons have not trusted governments. Um, and we need to hear them and we need to counter it with, with love and patience and compassion. There are others who are putting misinformation out there on vaccine and everything else who have evil intent. They have, there's, talking to them isn't gonna help because they've either gone down that rabbit hole or they're deliberately misinforming because they don't, you know, there you get the, white supremacists or the, you know, the right wing groups that are, are trying their hardest to, to destroy, destroy democracy and any semblance of, of, you know, of, of a collectivity. So don't break your heart with those people. You can't. And, and listening, listening to somebody who's, or speaking to somebody whose ears are closed and whose heart is closed is disrespectful of yourself. Don't do it. No, try to figure out the difference between those types of information because you're going to meet that. You're all young. You're going to meet that a lot in your life. Try to figure out. It's the same thing with criticism. Some of it's justified and you should hear it. Others is just meant to derail you and then you have to protect yourself. Um, that's the being kind to yourself part that really matters. So in closing, I want to thank you once again, Maud and Sadie and Haroon for joining us today and for giving this great talk. I guess one of the things that most inspires me about any intergenerational talk is simply the fact that it's intergenerational, that we get to speak across the divides that are sort of inherent to an ageist society where we, we're expected to not want to do that or not try to do that. So I really appreciated that breadth of the discussion and hearing from all of you has been really great. Uh, I want to thank all of you for joining us out in Zoom land on and, and putting your questions in the Q&A and chatting in the chat. We have 104 participants. It's really lovely. Um, if you're not already on Parkland's email list, please go to the website and sign up to get updates on our upcoming research and events. Parkland relies on the financial support of individuals and organizations, so please also consider making a donation if you can. Uh, and we'll continue doing research and putting great events on like this one. We had originally planned back when we thought we could host the conference in person, to have our regular conference Parkland party to celebrate Trevor Harrison after being with Parkland for the past 25 years. We have decided to postpone this event until we hopefully get together in person at the annual Parkland Gala, uh, which uh, is tentatively being planned uh, to, uh, to be hosted in Edmonton in February. We also hope to see you tomorrow afternoon at 2.30 for the amazing Alicia Elliott. Enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you for coming and have a great rest of your day. Have a good one, y'all.